Thank you. Um, so hello everyone, thanks for having me. So today I will talk about group standard reputation from a rather non-classical perspective. So if there's one thing I would like you to remember from this talk is that I see group standard reputation as an example of a game, a game theoretical game, rather with inconsistencies and also with strategies. So in my talk I will just briefly talk about rest of discovery, that is I think common in both Indica and Lakatosh, and I will use this evidence to identify the game theoretical and inconsistent is inconsistent the friendly or quite consistent elements of proofs and reputations. And I will conclude by saying that you know proofs and reputations essentially is a quite consistent game. <clears throat> and my my motivation comes from also not not just from Lakatosh but also from Hintika because Hintika, you know in epistemology we know Hintika from game theoretical semantics, from epistemic logic and so forth. But also he has an interesting theory of called you know, interrogative models of inquiry. So as I said, I think they both have common elements and they both argue that contradictions promote knowledge growth and they all both offer a heuristic method for knowledge growth <clears throat> and they arrive at different theories. So I will argue that these both elements sort of support my claim about game vertical use of Indica's and Lakatoshi's methodologies. So let me briefly explain to you what interrogative models of inquiry is of Indica. So he is an inquirer and he's given a th starting theory a basic theory, primitive law, T, and the question. So you're supposed to answer this question using the theory, supposedly using um, derivatives of standard classical logic, and also you are allowed to ask questions to nature or an oracle, an all-knowing mighty oracle who are supposed to give you a correct answer. So the problem is, what if you receive a relevant answer or an uncertain answer from the theory or from even from the oracle? So you may bump into a epistemic problem. And I think this epistemic problem is bigger than it looks like because Hintika addressed it in Socrative Epistemology at, an, at a page three, very early. And he says that an important aspect of this general applicability of the interrogative model is its ability to handle uncertain answers, the answers that may be false. The model can be extended to this, to this case <clears throat> simply by allowing the inquirer to tentatively disregard bracket answers that are dubious, read it as inconsistent or uncertain or ambiguous. Equally obviously, further inquiry might lead the inquirer to reinstate on bracket a previously bracketed answer. So you can bracket, on bracket, so on so on. This means thinking of inter interrogative inquiry as a self-corrective process. I'm not going to go into the ontology of this, but this suggests that there's a strategy that he needs for answer selection. Some answers may deductively give you a contradiction, and along the way you may revise the theory and you may go back and unbracket what you have previously bracketed. So this is indeed a strategy. And he continues towards the end. In a typical application of interrogative inquiry, for example, uh, the cross-examination of a witness in a court. The inquirer cannot simply accept all answers at their face value. They can be false, and we must have rules allowing, allowing the rejection, or as I will call it, bracketing of an answer. But this is totally unrealistic. How can we possibly know? How can we possibly know and hope to formulate realistic rules for the rejection or acceptance of any answers or any data that any inquirer might receive? So as I said, so, I mean, this is because of epistemology. And on top of it, on, on top of the strategic element, there is also an element of dealing with inconsistencies. The theory works with inconsistencies. And then, of course, being a classicist, Hintika tries to aim at a consistent theory, but that doesn't have to be that way. So my answer is, this is a game, it's a game theory, we can use game theory elements to eliminate this problem. We can suggest that the inquiry simply chooses the assumptions and responses that may help, that may give him a win in this game, if we carefully define what is a win, what is a loss. And on top of it, the inquiry can win the game if, if, if you can't win the game, then we can simply select another set of, set of strategies, another set of moves, and try to, to play again. So this is what he meant by this regress in bracketing and unbracketing certain assumptions. So this is, I think, a rather non-classical way of approaching um, epistemology and the context of discovery. So we are allowed to work with uncertain, contradictory, ambiguous responses. 
these are propositions, and we have to allow them in our system to work with them. And that is, I think, the definition of non-classicity in Intikar. So we have to have, in a nutshell, a game theoretical strategizing to choose what move to make when bracketing is required. And also we have to have a non-classical logical model so that we can work with inconsistencies for whatever goal you wish to have. So we, I think we also have similar, similar notions in the Katoshian methodology. We have to deal with monsters that require some game theoretical strategizing. Which monsters, which, how to identify monsters, what to do with monsters. And managing proofs that do not prove requires some sort of a non-classical logical understanding. And one of the things that, you know, the, the subtitle of the book is the logic of scientific discovery, but what is that logic, I think is very ambiguous. So in my opinion, first our reputation is a classical example where you have, where you have to have strategic reasoning and non-classical elements. So that is sort of the goal of my talk, to show you, I convince you what these are. So just to make sure you're on the same page, when I call per consistent logic or per consistency, what I mean is a system, a logical system that doesn't explode. So in a per consistent system, you can draw, uh, in a per consistent system, contradictions do not entail everything. There will be something that you won't be able to deduce from a contradiction. That is actually that is just a negation of the explosion principle, Aristotelian explosion principle. And sometimes I use it interchangeably. Dialectism is the view, which is a semantic counterpart, I would say, is the view that some statements are both true and false. And there's a big debate on this, which I will not go into. So my claim in a nutshell was proofs and reputations are per consistent games. So let me just spell out the elements of these games. So again, just in a nutshell, um, what proofs and reputations is, and methodology is, from the core field is a um, very well known essay. <coughs> we know the strat we know the schema of proofs and reputations is. And there are many again big literature about this. But what I can show you here is that this algorithm, this algorithm is very much a per consistent system. Because you have a counterexample and you have to work with the counterexample. So apart from the prism of conjecture and the proof elements, you need to work with the global counterexamples, you need to make deductions with those counterexamples, and you have to also make sure that some things are not deducible of this. Because you're not just giving up and saying that, saying that everything goes. There's a method, there's a strategy that you need to follow. Be it Lakatoshi, be it Hintikan, anything. But there is a strategy. So this algorithm allows us to make a lot of searches. We can control some of the parameters, we can search counterexamples, we can re-examine the proof, rewrite the proof, and we can try to turn counterexamples into examples. And all these things, as I mentioned, is, a, is, is just a bunch of strategies. A quick example. Right at the beginning of the book, we had this um, hollow cube example. So if you call the, 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 the Euler and conjecture with chi, and we will see that we have two objects, the cube and the hollow cube, in the book. For the cube, the Conjecture of hold, so we have chi. However, for the hollow cube, it doesn't hold because e minus e plus f equals four. So we have negation of the conjecture. So in the same system, we have chi and not chi. That's okay. So all the revision theories have something to say about this. But from a logicist's perspective, I can say that not everything follows from this contradiction. Lakatos offers a lot of methods. For the sake of this toy example, let's take the move as redefine the polyhedron. So this is a move, and this is one of the moves that you can do. However, you can just um, forget about this and think that everything will work after this. And there are many other moves that you can talk about, re-examine the proof in corporate lemma, declare exceptions, so on and so forth, that we all are familiar with. However, as I said, just because we have a move, a strategy to follow doesn't mean that everything works. You can't just say, for example, oh, there's a contradiction, oh, let's just accept the proof and go on and move on. So we don't say that. That means that from a contradiction, there's some propositions that do not follow. So this simple observation, I think, shows that proofs and reputations is indeed very consistent. So the immediate question I would say is that, well, if I'm talking about game theoretical approach to proofs and reputations, then I must sort of 
It is vaguely identified how these game theoretical concepts match with the elements in first interpretations. What is a strategy? What is a move? So I think that the strategies in first interpretations are pretty clear. And we are given a lot of strategies to deal with all these exceptions, monsters, so on and so forth. For example, um, needless to say, revising the lemma, redefining concepts, redefining definitions, monsters, learning from, from proof that do not prove. And these are essentially the strategies that knowingly produce a loss because there's some benefit in it. Whatever that benefit is, I'm not going to touch that topic. But there, if you have a proof that do not prove and you think that this is useful for your epistemology, then you knowingly produce a loss. Well, this loss, on the other hand, if you are again dilutive, may also bring you some win in some other game or in some other strategy because there's a purpose when you're doing this. It doesn't prove what they set out to prove, but there's some epistemic benefit in it. And that is the dialectism. For example, you can re-examine the proof. We can, and that will correspond to strategic proving. So you have a very broad strategy and you will narrow down that strategy to obtain a bit more concrete result, maybe perhaps, um, perhaps even a higher payoff. And that is strategy proving. And re-examining proofs in proof annotations can be seen as an, an application of that. And you also are allowed, allowed to revise proofs. That is very interesting, again, non-classically, because that corresponds, corresponds to revising a strategy. But the definition of the strategy should include all possible moves and previously determined that suggest that you are not even allowed to revise your strategy, because what you are doing is part of your strategy a priori. So that is a non-classical way of, again, defining the strategy. So again, we have a lot of moves as well. So at each strategy, at each node, whenever we see a contradiction, whenever we arrive at a problem point, let's say, we have a set of available moves. Re-examine dilemmas, redefine concepts, exclude the country example, so on and so forth. The reason why I have been trying to build up all these concepts is that because the, one of the foundational concepts in game theory is the Nash equilibrium, or in general equilibrium, because it gives us sort of a way to solve these games, solve these problems. So if you are going to approach first interpretation from a game theory perspective, then the first major question is, what is the equilibria of your game? What is the equilibria of the game of first interpretations? What does it mean? How we can define it? So Nash equilibrium means that the players are not better off by changing only their own strategy in a non-cooperative game. I see this dialogue as a rather non-cooperative game where you know, Delta and all the um, Gamma are just fighting over some non -co uh, concepts and definitions. So if we see this as a non-cooperative game, it suggests that they are trying to reach an equilibrium, reach a solution, while maintaining a balance between their own strategies. They don't give up and just lead the way to the, their opponent. They're still sort of, sort of fighting. If you give me a country example, I will just try to find a way to define my idea earlier definition and try to sort of fight on. But they, they stop somewhere. They just it's an infinite regress. That means that they are trying to reach an equilibrium. And I will show you a quick example of where this equilibrium might mean. And my philosophical claim here is um, a bit modest. I think proof of is a really good example of the move from homo economicus to homo heuristics. So instead of playing the rational agent in foundational game theory who was trying to maximize his own payoff. We are trying to move to a bit more evolutionary or um, game theory where we want to express what the agent is. The agent here is, the agent is here is, a, is, a, is, a, is discovered rather than rational. So the long-term goal of this project is to establish that we can move from homo economicus to homo heuristics, where, we, where the essential part is not just the maximizing your payoff, but rather expressing the, the, the concept of discovery or, or the evolution in your game and in your equilibrium. So one of the things that I like to explore more is another direction in this project is the, in the intuitionist take on this, because the, 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 in, the, the, the the value on connection between truth, proof, and strategies from an intuitionist perspective can be dualized, so to speak. So when you dualize intuitionism, you get paraconsistency. So if you dualize this connection, 
using the, the elements of proof certification, what you obtain is, instead of truth, you have dialectic truth. Instead of proofs, you have proofs that do not prove. Instead of strategies, you have strategy, winning strategies that do not only bring the win, but also, in addition, they bring a loss. So you can sort of come up with these concepts, come up with the foundational elements of a game, of a new game theory, I would say, using the dualized notions of intuition and logic. And some of this work has been already been discussed in, in many, many different areas, but um, it's also interesting. So um, I will just give you a quick example of how these ideas play out. So let's start with the proof interpretations and at the early, in the early pages of the book, um, Gamma and Delta are debating the definition of a polyhedron. Gamma says it's a solid whose surface consists of polygonal faces. Delta thinks that it is a surface consisting of a system of polygons. And I couldn't just help but not including this funny code from Delta. A woman with a child in her room is not a country example to teach that human beings have one hand, one head. And then comes the country examples. The first one is against alpha, the other one is against delta. And then you know what happens, they keep revising their definitions and more definitions and more country examples and the dialogue continues. But what happens here is that they, when given a contradiction, when given a country example, they have two options, they can either cooperate they can, okay, say, okay, so country example, let's revise and let's agree on another definition. Or let's revise our definitions and agree on a third meta definition. Or they can just say, no, I'm not changing my definition. I will, rather than sort of learning from your definition or learning from your country example, I try to improve my own theory. So I will defect. I will not cooperate. So cooperate in this case will mean that they will agree and they will acknowledge the country example and essentially improve their definition and revise their theory. The fact means that they will not even recognize the country example and try to sort of monster it out. So this is actually, this, this game produces a prisoner's dilemma. So iteration, it becomes an iteration of prisoner's dilemma. So players so have two options. They can either cooperate or they can both, both for Delta and, and, and Gamma. If both cooperate, it's good for both of them. So they get high payoff. However, if they both defect, that means that if they both do not recognize the country example, monster is out, they will narrow down their domain, and they will get the least possible path one for both of them. However, if one of them cooperates and the other one does not, cooperating my last one, let's assume, will benefit from it and advance more than the other one, but will not advance as further as both of them cooperating. The reason is because just me cooperating and not be able to convince the opponent is less valuable than both of us acknowledging the country example and benefiting from it. So as I said, this is an example of prison's dilemma. And that's important in the sense that uh, because we know, uh, sorry, we know the equilibria point of the prison's dilemma and we know level of the prison's dilemma. And the, in, this, in this case, the equilibria, the solution, the Nash equilibrium is where both cooperate. Because if you are in, at this point, if you are delta, as long as gamma keeps cooperating, switching from you cooperating to defecting, you loss you payoff. So that's not in your interest. You shouldn't do that. Similarly, if you are gamma, if you are gamma, and if delta changes its position, you are also losing payoffs. So it's not in your interest to change your position while gamma is fixed with your own uh, move. So you you have no incentive. Effect. You, sorry, you say you have no incentive to change your move, change your strategy. So both of them are better off by cooperating. So this toy example, this simple and clear explanation that once you meet a country example, all you need to do like, from a Lakatoshi perspective is to cooperate and revise your definition. That's why we see in the, in the dialogue all the time, all the players, all the pupils revise their definition, do something like that when they meet a country example. They don't just stop playing. So they do something that means that they have two options, and this is sort of the quick game theoretical explanation of what you need to do when you see a country example. It is in your best interest to cooperate and revise your strategy. So I used I used prisoner dilemma, but you can use 
similar examples from using matching pennies or battle of sexes, because they all will give you interesting explanations of why and how the players are choosing these moves. So as I mentioned, this is a non-classical game. This is non-classical, as I said, because this, some of your strategies are inconsistent, such as proofs that do not prove. Some of the elements of your moves are also non-classical, because sometimes you revise, but you still end up with a contradiction. So it just doesn't, you are not, I mean, the, the pupils are not distinctive only potent, you are not just done after one revision. It's a process, it is a practice, so on and so forth. Yeah? Oh, I'm quick. So that means that I have more time to, to, to discuss the conclusion, because I think the common themes between Hindika and Lakadoja are still relatively under study. But in my opinion, they encourage us to understand the applicability of game theoretical reasoning and strategic reasoning in both methodologies. <coughs> and being a per consistent logician, it also serves the per consistent agenda, because I think the new area of playground is a new playground for per consistency and gives it a direct relation to the philosophy of mathematical practice and methodology of mathematical practice. And in my opinion, it's also a very exciting case of logical pluralism. Because I mentioned that I consider per consistency as a dualism, as a sort of a dual of some intuitionistic logic. That means that if you dualize the whole Lakatosha methodology, you may end up with a, at least a meta theory of some intuitionistic logic. And a lot to be done. What I gave is a very toy example, but that toy example I think serves a big purpose because then we can analyze focus on these specific cons concepts, such as proof, on proof, and the logic of rigor. And um, there are a lot of things that I haven't even mentioned, such as the relationship between Hegelian dialectics, Lakatoshian heuristics, and logical dialectism and pluralism that is still largely unexplored from a game theoretical and strategic reasoning perspective, that I don't know why. Um, because if there's an element of rationality in Lakatoshian and similar elements of rationality exists in game theoretical reasoning, I believe. And the connection between that still, as I said, still remains unexplored. And I hope that this work will, will motivate some further work in these directions. And thank you.